The skies above us are dotted with aircraft, making thousands of flights every day. And it's not just commercial airliners carrying passengers and cargo. There's private pilots like me, flying all sorts of amazing machines. But there's one thing we all share in common. We all need somewhere to land. So I'm going to take you on a journey to visit some of the country's most unusual and spectacular airfields. We'll explore the areas they serve, meet the characters that fly there, and check out the aircraft they fly as we take flight across Britain. General aviation in this country has been part of our being for the last century. And Britain has led aviation in the past and I want to see it lead aviation in the future. You must have been frightened. The pilot was seriously old and experienced and man such as yourself. <laughs> you know what, if I had a parasol on my back I would actually jump out and like, do you know, yeah. Do you mean a parasol or a parachute? Parachute. A parasol might, might not be quite <laughs> effective. <laughs> we'll discover skill, passion, adventure and romance. Find fun, friendship and the quest for exploration. There's planes and they're just plain crazy. Talk to the people that keep us in the air and challenge the weather, trying to keep us on the ground. The weather really has turned now. Farmer, good afternoon. Golf Mike Charlie Papa Romeo. Golf Mike Charlie Papa Romeo, Farmer, a hello, flash message. Uh, PA 32 out of uh, Headcorn, routing up to uh, Dover and back. Uh, just for a basic service, please. Golf Papa Romeo. Golf Papa Romeo, escort 1734, basic service, London QH 1013. 1734-1013, thanks, Golf Papa Romeo. I'm very pleased to have today as my co-pilot, Paul Bowhill from the Channel 5 series, Can't Pay, will take it away. Are you not going to take away my aircraft today, Paul? Hopefully not. I'll Thank tell you when we get back. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. Depends on the landing, I guess, does it? It does, yeah. <laughs> so you're a High Court Enforcement Officer that's, that's obviously found fame with the TV as well. How, how does that whole High Court Enforcement thing work? The system's quite simple. First and foremost, you need to get a judgment in the County Court. When that's been established, the county court system of collecting money is, is flawed, whereas the high court system, because everybody's working on a commission-only basis, is far more effective. So for a fixed fee, which is about £160, you can change the system to the high court. It then gets farmed out to a sheriff's office, or as it's now known, an enforcement office of your choice, and they will then pursue it effectively on a no-win, no-fee basis from that point onwards. So how did you go from that to getting involved with the, the TV programme? Well, I was involved with a, another enforcement company and they were looking for somebody who participated in the television programme, but they were looking for somebody who was a bit of a maverick, uh, someone who had been in the trade for a long time, and I, I ticked both boxes, and that I'd been a sheriff's officer then, as we were known, an enforcement uh, agent now, for about 30 years. So I ticked the box of knowing the job. I also ticked the box of being a little bit cavalier. I didn't mind appearing on the television. And it provided me with an opportunity to possibly change the face of the industry, which the television programme, not my, that's not my work, the television programme was put together in a fantastic way. And it has effectively, over the last five years, completely changed people's perception of the way the court work is done. So we've succeeded in that. And do you think it's actually attributed to more people using the High Court process as well to collect debts? Yes. It, it, it made people aware on both sides of the coin, so people who were owed money could see that it was an efficient system. People who owe money could see that it really did happen. They did come and knock on the door when the game was up as it were. 
You, you must have heard some amazing things happen. Have you ever repossessed an aircraft? We have. Uh, even more astounding, we once took over a Russian submarine, but an aircraft, uh, and this is when I was a, a sheriff officer in Kent 25 years ago, is we had a report from our from Manston Air, Airfield that there was a, a plane there which belonged to the Ugandan president, Idi Amin, it had landed, it incurred fueling and landing charges which hadn't been paid. They couldn't impound it. Uh, we had the authority to do that after a writ was issued. So we drove out to Manston one morning to find this uh, 747, quite substantial aircraft, a little bit raggedy around the edges as you might expect, not quite up to British Airways standards, but it was certainly there and we then seized it. So we went through the paperwork, but there was then an issue as to how do we make sure they don't fly it away. Because a clamp couldn't be found that would be big enough to do that. <laughs> so we did the next best thing, we got the airfield people out, their engineering department to jack it up and take the front wheels off. So that definitely wasn't going to go anywhere then. And ultimately, the aircraft stayed there and it was scrapped. It was scrapped. Wow. So it never took off again. But the, the Manston aircraft people were so impressed with that, they had another situation within a few weeks where an aircraft which was being refurbished and was in a hangar, nobody really knew whether he could fly or not, but it was worth about £5 million. Pounds. It was an old uh, US Army bomber, so, and he's seen service. So, again, the Maverick in me, we cracked that one couldn't fly it away because we welded the hangar door shut. <laughs> we, went in, we welded the stop ends and did six inch tack welds all the way up to the door as high as you could reach. So that stopped that and eventually the rent was paid. So the laugh then was, well who pays or goes to the trouble of cutting the doors open. We just passed up the, that back to the tenant. He wasn't a happy bunny. <laughs> and I guess now that you're a uh a TV celebrity, that must affect the way people handle you when they see you on the doorstep and actually out in normal day-to-day life as well. Oh yeah, it's, it's double barreled really, is that uh, we knocked on the door at 7 o'clock one morning, the lady came to the door in a dressing gown and said, you're the guys off the television, aren't you? And I said, yes we are. She said, come in and have a cup of tea. <laughs> so it was one of the easiest jobs, we came away with about £9,000. And for, a for a debt that her husband owed that she knew nothing about, so it was slightly embarrassing for him, not for us. Yeah, yeah. And have you ever been to a house where they're actually watching you on TV as you've knocked on the door? Uh, not noticeably, <laughs> but I would think there's an ever likely possibility that that will happen now. Well, they're on so many channels on repeats, aren't they, these things? That you yeah, but everybody seems to have uh, can't pay on continual repeat, yeah, yeah. as well as on Netflix. And what's the uh, sort of oddest repossession that you've you've done? Strangest thing? When well, your submarine and aircraft are fairly strange, aren't they in themselves? I think one of the most heartrending was really where we were asked to to take a horse, which was a show jumper. And the sad part of that was the guy wouldn't tell us where the horse was. Well, how do you identify a horse? We had photographs, but nothing that was very positive. But he'd owned the horse for 18 years, so it was like a, it was like a child to him. I could see how difficult it was going to be. But I warned him that if he didn't surrender the horse, that he would be, uh, it would happen on a showground once, which would cause him, it would, would cause him much greater embarrassment. And I didn't actually do that part of the job, because so I thought I was too soft for it. But indeed, the horse was actually. Uh, taken under our control uh, at a horse at a horse event, and eventually that was resolved. Nice view. That, nice uh, view. The, sorry to interrupt. The white cliffs today. They look. Yeah. Nice view. Yeah. Well, I guess horses are quite valuable as well, are they in themselves? It was. It was because it was a show jumper or an event horse. It was obviously worth a lot, a lot of money, a bit like a race horse. I suppose that might have been worth, shall we say, sixty or seventy thousand pounds. The most expensive item that we've ever repossessed, taken possession of, uh, is a racing car, a Formula One racing car. Oh wow. But again, the debt was probably not huge by comparison, but it was the only unencumbered asset that we could actually seize.
So, although it was worth a million pounds, engine and car together, uh, it was the only thing we could take. We didn't take it away, but we seized it and told them it couldn't be moved. And they also paid the debt. Are these debts sometimes people have just forgotten them, or have they just got into an argument with somebody and they, they want to take it to the very nth degree? They fall into about three categories. The first is that people can't afford to pay, so they've got into a situation and the debt has spiralled out of control. Not least of which is if you take a parking fine, which might be £60, but you have a batch of those, you could end up with an enforcement agent knocking on the door for well over £1,000. So that's where the debt spirals out of control. Or you might, if you're running a business, take short-term loans to help you out of a little bit of a spot, but the term is extended. So you take a loan for three months, it extends, and because it's short-term, a bit like short-term parking at an airport, very expensive, and it turns into a long-term loan, horrendous rates. So, and I've known uh, a loan that could start off at 150,000, ended up over a few years at well over a million. Right. So it then becomes a disaster and it's very, very difficult to collect. And then, of course, the final one, where people just try not to pay. They don't want to pay. Those are the ones where people deserve everything they get, in my view. And do you, do you like flying in light aircraft? Yeah, it's fine. If you're going to die, you'll die. <laughs> How long did you say you've been flying? Oh, it's two weeks now. Two weeks, two weeks okay. yeah. yeah. I took off from an airfield in, uh, in Dorset once. The guy was a car dealer. He didn't tell me he'd only been flying for two weeks. But as he came into land, he clipped the hedge of the airfield. Oh, I said, do you do that often, or is that like a deliberate marker? <laughs> I've never actually come back into land on my own, he said. <laughs> well, thanks for telling me. So if you'd had that information before you went, you might not have gone. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Yeah, he was a car dealer. Should have expected more. Any paparazzi back with you? Roger, pass a message. We have uh, inbound again to you with about 10 miles to run and uh, we're doing the uh, downwind left hand uh, 10. Hi from uh, QFE 1010. 1010, thanks, Scott. Paparazzi. And this is your neck of the woods now. We're sort of. It is, yeah, we're yeah, all just flying over home. But we won't show anybody that. No, we don't want to show them where you live, do we? <laughs> You might have your own people knocking at the door. That's right, yeah. Curiously, although the pro programme is very widespread, over the past five years, there's only been about a dozen occasions where people have been really unpleasant in the street. So if you counter that against the thousands who wish us well and enjoy the programme, although why they enjoy it is, is sort of mixed anyway, does it make them feel very lucky are they voyeurs who like to see people in trouble, or do they treat it as an educational project? We've got kids as young as 12 years old, massive fans. So it's a huge fan base, as well as a fan base in Canada, the States, the whole of Europe, Australia, New Zealand, to mention yeah. but a few. I've got Papa Emery's uh, downwind, 1-0 left hand. Roger, nothing else reported to the Okay, thanks. See you, Rumbo. I can see you now, yeah? Oh, can right, you see yeah. it? Yeah. 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 Are you getting worried then? No, no, we landed at, uh, we landed at Manston once with a, a twin engine plane, but they talked us in because it was foggy. Oh, right. No radar and kit like that, but they actually said, you're now over the apron, the runway apron, look down. I got Paparomi's final uh, one zero to land. So did you not get worried by that? Or were you trusting I in did, the pilot? But the pilot, the pilot was seriously old and experienced, a man such as yourself. <laughs> but without the old thing. Yeah. <laughs> you breathe a sigh of relief at that point, just when the wheels are down? Um, or is it just normal? I used I used to. Yeah. Um, when I did my first two or three hundred hours, I used to yeah. think, oh, I'm back again, I'll survive. But now, <laughs> now I actually expect to get back every time. Oh, right. Whereas before, I didn't, I didn't always. There you are, back thank safely you, on the ground. Drive. Thank you, driver. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's a fascinating insight into your, uh, into your world.